Hi, this is Mark Linsenmeyer from the Partially Examined Life Philosophy Podcast and Blog. I'm here for the third time with Professor Fritjof Bergman to talk about new work. Now, though this is the third video that we've done for Blogging Heads, you don't need to watch the other two. We're going to explain what we're talking about right, right off the bat. Uh, so the focus today is the crown jewel of new work, as you've called it, Fritjof, which is the calling, that is, new work itself. And I think that might be a good place to start, is... Some people even were, were expressing with the previous videos, you know, I've watched you talk for two hours, I'm still not sure what new work actually is. And that's been a, my take here. Uh, long before, uh, you know, 20 years ago when I was taking a, a course from you at the University of Michigan, uh, and you were talking about new work, there was no uh, substantial community production or the kind of things we talked about in the previous podcast. It was just this idea that instead of doing job work, what new work would be would be an alternative, an improvement to, to job work would be something that you really, really want to do, something that would energize you. Can you lay out, I mean, is that what really new work is? Yes, exactly. Uh, the briefest definition of new work is that old work is work that one has to do, that one must do, that one to some extent suffers in doing. Uh, new work is work in opposition to that, in contrast to that. It is work that one really, seriously, very often passionately wants to do. So the transition is from work one must to do, that one is condemned to do, to work that one wants to do, and work that one really seriously wants to do, and that has many consequences. So why would we think that there Obviously, for some people, if you're uh, an artist wannabe, if you're a musician and you're chafing under the responsibilities of a regular job, then, you know, of course, people can identify that you might have something like a calling, which is, of course, a, a priestly term, a term from the religious tradition. But for everyday normal people, why would you expect that they, they have some sort of desire? Why can't they just be fulfilled, at least as fulfilled as they're going to be through a regular job? Well, part of this is simply fact. That is, I started new work in Flint, in the automobile city of Flint in 83, 84, 82, and it turned out as a fact. It is simply evidence, no fact, that many car workers passionately wanted to do some kind of work that they really cared about. And the idea of doing part of the time work in the plants, work on the shop floor, but part of the time, and that is crucial, nobody ever thought that you could only do work that you really wanted to do, but that as part of it, as a component of your work, that many, uh, from the very beginning, any number of workers, and I want to emphasize that, of course, women in Flint played a great role, and they said from the very start, that is something we want. We want not only the work in the shop, we want work that we also really care about. And that was the definition of how new work was an improvement, how it was a way of rising up from where work had been. And from the very beginning, but all the way through, that is now almost 30 years, sort of what work that one wants to do was identified with is the idea that work can be something, only if it is work that you really want to do. It can be something that gives you strength, that gives you energy, that gives you power, as opposed to drain you, as opposed to exhaust you. So that was one of the key elements that people thought. They wanted work that would allow them to become stronger and work that one really wants to do they identified with greater power, greater strength, greater vitality, more life was very often what people identified with. And maybe, I mean, we can give many examples, but I'll wait with that. Yeah, I mean, that. so you're saying people wanted to do something that would be more meaningful than what they're doing, but certainly they didn't all have something in mind, ready to hand, that they were ready to leap to, that part of the process is, is what coaching people? How do you get people to figure out what it is that would really energize them? That is now one of the absolutely most important and crucial questions. We said from the very beginning that people do not know what they really passionately want to do. 
In fact, we made up a term which gained in currency and became something of a common word. We said most people, not everybody, but many people suffer from what we called the poverty of desire. And by the poverty of desire, we meant, of course, a number of things, but among them, we meant precisely what you now raised, namely that most people, if you ask them, if I look at them intensely and say, well, what is it that you really want to do? They shrug, and what happens is that there is an embarrassed silence. So we decided, and that was a very crucial part of what we, from the beginning, tried to do. We decided that people did not know from the beginning what they really wanted to do. On the contrary, they suffered from the poverty of desire. There was nothing that they wanted very intensely, and what they wanted was not very clear to them. And if it became clear to them, it still was a long distance till they became reached a point where they really could do that with intensity. That, in fact, is the main purpose of a center for new work. A center for new work is a place, an institution, it is a building, it is a room with people that have experience in this, a, a building or a room that assists people in discovering very often over a longish period of time what it actually is that they passionately want to do. So we are at the opposite end of the idea that people already know that. They don't know that, and in fact, that is if you, the raison d'être for, well, that is the reason for having centers for new work, because the opposite is true, the opposite of people already knowing that. Now, what's, what's the level of professionalism going into this? It sounds like you're doing amateur psychotherapy or some, something like that of, of helping people with these, whether they're group sessions or individual sessions, helping people figure out what they really want. Who's actually doing the interviewing? What are their credentials? How did you decide that? Actually, uh, I will resist a little bit the word amateur. Uh, we decided to be very professional about this. And a part of the picture was that this is something that to some extent was already there uh, and had been done before and people were familiar with it. So we didn't start from a blank sheet. But at the same time, we felt strongly and there was lots of evidence of that that no, uh, that was not something that was done, and I'm really coming back to uh, your challenge uh, of amateur, that was not something that was really done with the seriousness that we intended to give it. That is, there is an awful lot of talk. In fact, let me put it like this. When we started this in 83 and in 84, people shrugged their shoulders and smiled and smirked and said, well, what is this? Helping people to discover what they really want to do. Uh, it turned out in the meantime that on the contrary, now, you know, almost 30 years later, this has become one of the most common things that in countless different contexts and settings, and there are any number of people, and some of course very professionally trained, who assist people in finding out what they really want to do. Our feeling is that they don't do it professionally. They don't know enough. And I will back this up by saying that it is not nearly enough. That is a very common thing that's said to somehow have people in some kind of whimsical fashion run across something that turns them on or something that whimsically excites them or that gives them a kind of kick. That is very often the opposite of what we intend. We say that it is difficult to find out what you really want to do. It is a long project and it takes work. And when you say, well, what's the training? Part of it is this, that I very often and you know, commonly am invited to address groups of people, large halls full of people who are all in the business, business of counseling people, of career counseling of people. This happens in high schools, that happens from people who graduate from college and on and on and on. Of course, it plays a very large role in many corporations with whom I've worked that people say, look, uh, we don't have the conviction that the people are doing the right thing. They're not really doing what they could do best. So make it so that for our company, in our company, they will do something they really care about because we know that will improve the company. So 
in contrast to other people, we in, involve people in a very intense and long training, and the most basic training I think anybody can understand. That is, uh, actually, if it comes down to it, most people have a very limited idea of the possibility of jobs, of the possibility of work, of what one can do. I mean, they, they name six things, uh, starting with the chimney sweep and ending up with king and so forth and cabbages. But uh, the fact that in, that in the last 10, 15 years, hundreds of new jobs, hundreds of new ways of working have emerged, they don't realize that. That is our expertise. That is, frankly, I very often get up in front of a very large hall of people who are trained counselors, and I talk to them for a while, and it's sort of an exchange. And at some point, I'm provocative, and I say, look, look, you don't have any business counseling. You don't know enough to counsel. You have no real idea of what it would take to counsel people in the area of work, because the area of work has become a science. You need to study the area of work, maybe for years, to, to responsibly counsel people on what they can do in the area of work. And it's not anything like enough to have gone to, to, you know, into some rustic area for one seminar and talked a little bit about how nice it is to have this work or that work. So, yes, that is part of what we do. We train people sometimes for months, quite frankly, sometimes for years, to get to the point where they have hundreds of examples uh, that they can immediately dish, dish up when somebody says, well, I don't know what I really want to do. The response is, well, have you thought of this? Have you thought of that? Have you thought of the other thing? And that is very much gives you an idea of the ethos, of the ambience, of the mood in which this happens. That is, the idea is that we train people so that the minute somebody says, yeah, I would very much like to do something that I really care about, but I have no idea what it is. The response is, okay, here are 75 examples. Let's start from there. Have you thought of these? any of these 75? Well, and it sounds like it, it, it's a very interactive process. It's not you can't know just by hearing about things. You have to actually get out and try things. And so part of the process is hooking people up with, what, internship opportunities, that kind of thing? What? No, absolutely, you're dead right. That is, uh, talking about it is not enough. And in fact, I would say, uh, in the spirit of much else that we have talked about, that that's one of the great weaknesses, one of the great defects of our current setup that whether you talk about high schools or colleges or whatever, or corporations, people don't have enough opportunity to try, to experiment, to examine, to find things. Uh, they are pushed more or less quickly, especially if you sort of think of the typical situation where a few jobs are on some blackboard and somebody hands you a slip and says, well, go out there and apply. That is the opposite of what we envision. In, in our setup, no, people are trained to know a great diversity of different jobs. And very important, exactly what you say, the idea is not just to talk about it, but to suggest it. And then, and that is again part of the function of a center for new work. A center for new work isn't just a talking institution. It has countless connections with all sorts of enterprises with all sorts of various ways in which people already are working, and a center for new work makes suggestions and then says, wait, wait, I have the phone, I'll pick up, I'll find out, could you do an internship there, could you do an internship there, and that is how it happens, that people get an opportunity to experiment, to find out, to try. I would say to be even more aggressive about this, that this is one of the worst things about our high schools. I work a great deal in high schools. And it's one of the worst things that people uh, don't have an opportunity to test what they want to do. But I would go beyond that and say, I, of course, also teach a great deal of graduate students. And it's, to my mind, downright grotesque that people study law 
and it takes years to have finished the law degree, but they never had an opportunity to find out what it's like to be a lawyer. And what has happened in my experience very often, that people spend years getting ready, and then they spend three months, and in three months they discovered that isn't what I want to do. And so they were miserable, but then it was also a little late to do something else, and there is a dilemma. I mean, it seems a lot of what you're describing is just being a good guidance counselor, being a good job counselor. But I think that the chief innovation that new work is supposed to bring to this is the realization that what might be psychologically optimal for you might not actually be an existing job at all. And that, that the there's no reason to expect that the jobs actually on offer, even taking into account all this great variety of new opportunities, um, you know, that they're not necessarily going to do the job. I mean, what, what is that? Is that correct? That is absolutely correct. Now, I mean, I have written things and very often give talks about the fact that new work is a political idea. New work is a social idea. New work is an idea that intends to be transformative. So, yes, it is a very important part that, no, the now existing kinds of jobs are very probably not at all satisfactory in terms of what we are trying for. We are trying for something that is quite dramatically different from the commonly current now available job. And that is in fact some built into our language that is we make it very clear that we are not talking about jobs. We are talking about work and we make a great effort to get across to people that no, work is something very different from jobs. And so the idea is that we are now in a transition, a gigantic transition that may be as significant as the transition from hunting and gathering to agriculture. There may have been very few transitions that were anything like as revolutionary and as dramatic as the transition now. We now are in the transition where the job system, which has only existed for the last 200 years and which was unsatisfactory in many ways from the beginning and became ever worse and worse, that the job system is now going under, that that sun is setting. And in contrast to that, new ways of working arise. And it's very important that the new ways of working that arise, we all know this. I'm just making it explicit that the new ways of working that arise require more talent, require more ingenuity, require more innovation. Those are the, the catchwords that you hear every day. So we are preparing people for works, for things they can do that prepare them to be innovative, that prepare them to be inventive, that prepare them to be imaginative. And that is, of course, a very different thing from uh, the usual sort of career counseling. In fact, that's where I insist very much on sharp oppositions and sharp distinctions that I mentioned. I work often in colleges and graduate schools and also in, in high schools. The, the, the current way of doing this is that one sort of looks around and sees whether there is something that creates a kind of cheerfulness in a student. And then was, ah, ha, ha, that's what, I guess that's what you want to do. We think that is grotesque. That is a prostitutional, so to say. No, on the contrary, entirely new ways of working, ways of working that are being invented now, are, uh, so to say, are what we are addressing. And in that way, new work is really very in advance of m much else. That is, we very consciously, new work very consciously is an effort to prepare people for the next stage of technology, for the next stage of the economy, for what is now coming. So we are preparing people for the future. All right. So can we get a little more specific? I mean, it, so let's say I come in, I, I, I find that I have a talent for writing. I enjoy writing. And so a regular career counselor might, might hook me up, a good one, and say, look, there are all different kinds of writing one can get into. One could be a travel writer. One could be a technical writer. Um, I would find most of the time, you know, just from my experience actually doing some of these kind of jobs, that uh, 
the, the best way to, to, uh, to douse your enthusiasm for something is to professionalize it. And in fact, if I, yes, I, so if I have a flair for a, a certain kind of writing, maybe I haven't even figured out exactly what kind it is. But then, you know, it might be good to try something like technical writing or, or uh, but, but if I find that then I have to then, I actually get a job with a software company and have to do that for 45 plus hours a week, then that will surely make me not have brain space to do any other kind of writing and really never make me never want to write again. <laughs> so that, that the idea of hooking people up with the opportunities that are out there, and even if it's, oh, you know, the low, the low tech, low skill jobs are being replaced by machines. They're being outsourced. You need to get ahead of the curve, get more innovative, get, get brighter. That uh, even that, I mean, that sounds like sort of the propaganda of the existing uh, economic machine that is trying to, to somehow, you know, we're all going to be made into these uh, su super soldiers who will be able to take on the jobs of the 21st century. But that's not really what you're saying at all. Exactly, exactly. And I want to say loud and clear that I very much hope that the people who are listening to us now listen to you very carefully, because what you said just in the last three minutes is maybe one of the most important things that can be said, and one of the things that really might make a big difference and might get across to people what we're really talking about. That is basic, basic to new work is the idea of not one thing, but usually we use the expression of three things. That is, there is community production, there is work in enterprises, those are two foundational parts of new work. But in addition to that, and we say on top of that, that is better than that. Now, you started this by saying that this is somehow the crown jewel of new work. Yes, there are those other things, and they are also valuable, and they are important, and they are necessary. They are indispensable. But what it really all leads up to is now not a job in writing, but a part of your work could be writing that is tailored to you, that is made for you, that has been sort of emerged in conversation with several people, or especially with one person, you know, we very much believe in mentoring people, where a great, great deal of time was an effort went into helping you to discover what sort of writing is the kind of writing that is really right for you. And I ring, I rise to what you said, because I myself have tried to do a few efforts in writing myself. And it is... <laughs> enormously important to realize that there are no end of different ways of writing and that writing is not at, uh, by any means one thing, but that there are thousands of different ways of writing of which you must find the one that fits you. Then writing can become a calling. Then writing can become a passion. Then writing can give you energy instead of drain you. But as, if you do the wrong kind of thing, it will do the opposite of all of these things. Yeah, it's, it seems that we often uh, we have this picture of the artist as an individual who just wants to break away from structures, get me out of my day job, and I can go compose symphonies all day. But actually, that's very difficult to self-motivate and compose symphonies all day. Some people are up for that, but many more people who have that sort of creative drive who would be energized by work, uh, you know, in fact, I think it's an entirely normal thing to need social support, to need uh, to need uh, institutions. So, so as you're saying, you know, a mentor or, you know, what, what a big difference it is for me as a musician to be in a band and have to show up every week, even if I don't feel like it, to do something with other people, as opposed to entirely creating music on my own and doing all the tracks that, that you need, you need some, some push to, to, uh, you know, you need people to work with, you need models, you need, uh, institutions. So just the, the, the wave of amateurism, uh, uh, you know, in a good sense on the web, you know, the number of people, even experts, who contribute their time to Wikipedia or something like that, that there's an institution out there that people can then latch onto and find that some of their passion can be expressed by, uh, can be channeled through this thing. It's not all just a self-invented, you know, passion is, is not, uh, can be a, a, you know, a group effort. 
No, let me add to that. You know, uh, I said a few minutes ago that one way to think about new work it is it is the structure, it is the organization of work that fits our time now and more and beyond that. It fits the, stru- the 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 culture that is emerging. We are ahead of our time. We are constructing the modality in which people work or the modalities in which people work that will arise in the future. And that applies exactly to what you were just now saying. Part of new work is the idea that no, 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 no. Uh, Don't go by what lots and lots of career counselors who, in my view, know very, very little about these things and irresponsibly counsel people, that somebody gives you the advice, okay, go into teaching. If you go into teaching, there will be weekends and there will be vacations and then those you can do your writing. If I may be blunt, I would say bullshit. I know no end of teachers who started that way, but who ended up not being able to write because the energy was drained away into whatever they were doing in teaching and there was no energy left to really write something important. So there you get a glimpse, a glimpse, an idea of how new work actually thinks. That is, we espouse the idea, we advocate the idea, we have developed the idea of community manufacturing. That means that in part time, in a few hours a week, you should be able to do things that will provide for you 80% of what you do. Not teaching, but community production will make it possible for you to be liberated, to be sufficiently liberated so that there is a real great part of you, a great chunk of your time that has been opened up and in which you really can dedicatedly and and with (laughs) intensity pursue your writing. That's exactly what new work as no among many, many other things is intending to do. To break up the monotony of job work and to make it possible for people to do part-time work, enough of that, but not too much of that. Enough of that so that plenty of energy and plenty of time is left over to do something that one really wants to do. Right. And folks who are Confused by that, if that sounds a little crazy, listen to our other videos, watch our other videos on bloggingheads.tv. And hopefully, you know, of course, that's the sticking point is people, you know, okay, fine, I can identify what I really want to do, but how is that in any way realistic? You got to be realistic. You got to eventually just bear down, get a job, look in the existing economy, fine, be innovative, be, uh, uh, you know, scour the web for opportunities that you might not have heard of before. But eventually, you need to settle. You need to be realistic. And I've, I, I know in your book, you, you had said that that's exactly the wrong message, that that is, that is a, a spiritual death to give that message to, to young people. That, yes, okay, explore these different things. But eventually, you need, to, you need to settle that. You need to be realistic. You need to get a job. Come on. That is, again, I mean, you say very valuable things, and I hope people really, really take in what you're saying. Because new work, you could almost define new work as a determined effort to create an alternative to that, to say, no, 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 don't settle for a job. In fact, in countless situations, I have been asked by important political people or by parents or by any number of people who have young people under their tutelage. Well, what would you say? What should we tell young people? One quick thing that I very often have said is tell them not to capitulate. Tell them not to capitulate to the job system but to insist that there is an alternative to the job system. And yes, it is very possible. In our age, it has become possible. That is one of our triumphs. That is one of the things that we should take delight in. That is one of the things that we should celebrate, that we have created technologies that do make it possible for people in maybe six hours a week to to manufacture, to produce, to create, to grow, to plant, to do everything that is necessary for life, but to have the largest part of life liberated, freed up to do something that is not a 
a giving up, that is not a capitulation, that is not, okay, I will make my peace with a job that will drain me, that will exhaust me, that I will experience as a mild disease and from which I will ultimately suffer. But on the contrary, insist that you can take care of the necessity with your left hand, that it is child's play, and that will open up for you the possibility of becoming a person that does something of consequence. All right, so that's the crux. You've demonstrated in that speech the, the, the difficulty, you know, you, you might think it's easy to inspire people. I don't think it's actually that easy. I think that we, it's good that we've had this conversation to, ins, to, to help, you know, set up the goal. And this is what drove me uh, for being interested in new work for the past 20 years since I, since I heard you lecture on it. Uh, at the University of Michigan was this idea that you know we don't have to settle, we don't have to uh, be be basically miserable. But you know, as long as you haven't presented a really clear picture with examples, a guidebook for how to do this, then it just sort of seems like you're raising people's hopes, and this is something that's not ready for prime time. So that just is a call. I'm not saying right now justify it. I'm saying this is a call. For, for more study, for more explanation, for more cooperative investigation of ways in which to make this situation work. That, that uh, yes, part of it is discovering that there is work that can energize you. It's not just a necessary evil. That work is actually a prime human need. Uh, having a reason to get up in the morning, having something meaningful to do, and then recognizing that the chances of that coinciding with any of the existing jobs out there are very slim. You might go into social work because you want to help people, but you find that you know the amount of work, the you know you feel like oh, it's very it's very frustrating to feel like you're not actually helping people. That the strictures of your organization are impinging upon you know. I'm not saying don't be a social worker. I'm not saying don't be a doctor. I'm not saying don't be a, a, an architect or a commercial artist. All these things that you might take on because you think that they're going to fulfill you in some way or another, but don't expect your whole life to be fulfilled by that, to gain meaning out of that. There's always organizational things that make any given job like that in some ways a drag. So you might be extremely lucky and be find yourself in a situation where, you know, just your regular well-paid job <laughs> gets you enough to get you up in the morning and to take you all the way to retirement and you feel like you did something meaningful with your life. Um, that is only going to be true for what? 5%, 2%, we would be making up a statistic. So if you're not in that situation, uh, or even if you are, you might find, you know, o o over time that you, you know, that there needs to be some more flexibility in the system, that, that even if you find something that is a good fit for you, you might find that, well, for salary reasons and other logistical reasons, you're, you're trapped in it. You have to keep doing exactly that thing that you were trained for. You don't feel like you have the ability to switch jobs, to uh, cut back to part-time and do more volunteer work, this other thing. So this, this whole new work is an effort to figure out realistic ways to, to actually do this. And, uh, you know, so I want to invite all the folks who are watching this to, to uh, you know, really talk about this with your friends, to, to uh, check out what uh, new work, new, newworknewculture.com. Is that right? Um, so that's where Fritjof's site, where he has some information. Uh, hopefully I'll be doing some more work with him to uh, interview some more of the people that he has been working with, you know, in Detroit, in third world countries, in Silicon Valley, uh, people involved with 3D printing and the other technologies involved in this uh, community production that you've mentioned. So there's so much still to explore. We will continue and please stay with us as we continue. All right. Thank you much. Bye-bye.